Well, I, I <laughs> Okay. It sounds weird, huh, when we talk like this with a microphone. But, it, but it's good because we have a, a transcript then. And there is another one, so I'll ask you all to use the microphone. Um, so for, for the records, my name is Vladimir Radunovic from Diplo Foundation. And I'm, I'm glad that we, that we gathered at least in a small number. And the initial idea of this roundtable basically was scheduled initially for the, for the day zero of, of uh, IGF. But we said, okay, let's do it at the end so that we could sum up the, um, the experiences of the IGF and the capacity building truck as well, but also uh, to try to gather all of us that are involved and interested in capacity building to, to d discuss more about it. And now I've be been discussing with some of you. I think this format is much more convenient than anything else. We asked for a round table, and the idea was to be a round table without any specific... Uh, Rather than a, a meeting than any kind of a panel or, or, or workshop to exchange uh, views. And one thing that, that I got the impression, and that's maybe the question for all of you, um, is that, that listening to the speeches at the beginning of the IGF, the high-level ones and the opening and so on, I, I think I've heard capacity building, capacity building, capacity building a dozen of times from everyone, governments, business, everyone. But I didn't get the impression, at one point I even prepared kind of a reaction and statement, but I just didn't get time, didn't have time to, didn't get time to, to respond to that on a panel. Uh, that none of them really realizes how complex it is. That. That it's not a matter of bringing a couple of people to the IGF or providing a short training to someone, but it's a process. It costs, it needs resources, it needs methodology, it needs experience, and so on. And there is a number of different layers of, of capacity building. And maybe one idea might be to come up with some kind of, uh, well, first, firstly the transcripts, where we can really comment on this, all of us, which will stay on record. Uh, come up with some kind of a, of, a, of a conclusion out of this meeting here. Um, even an invitation for all these that are mentioning capacity building to seriously consider that. And that includes funding, because you usually don't, don't talk about funding. Funding is something we don't want to talk about. But that's also a very important part. Uh, and then at the end, maybe we come with, with a, some kind of, a, I don't know, conclusion out of this workshop, which can go into the, the takeaways of the IGF, that we think that this should really be taken care of. I mean, there is a lot of, not really a lot, but there is a number of institutions, obviously, that are doing this for a long time, experienced. And instead of reinventing the wheel and just talking about as a bumper sticker, as, as we need capacity building, that we really try to get the folks help us do that. Huh? That's, that, that was my idea. And of course, we share among ourselves who does what, what are the, the needs in, in different regions, because I'm really glad to see that we are scattered around the world. That's, that's great from different organizations. Uh, so th that's, that's my idea. I have a couple of uh, agenda points which I shared before the IGF. But maybe starting with this, with this general thoughts about what do you think, whether, whether this has become really a bumper sticker just talking about, uh, about capacity building and how do we influence that? Huh? So anyone, I mean, uh, we have at least one more microphone, but uh, I don't know if we have more. But I think it will be okay. We have two of these. Anyone wants to comment? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Vladimir. It's Olivier Crepin Leblanc, chair of the At Large Advisory Committee. And uh, I can't speak on behalf of the At Large Advisory Committee, otherwise, I'd have to punt this over to the uh, community and wait 21 days before answering you. I don't think we have enough time to wait for that. Um, I'll share my personal experience as, as um, the At Large Community has got 160 At Large structures around the world, so it's a very wide ranging community that spans the whole world with very wide range of knowledge. Um, some uh, structures and, and, and some regions being very knowledgeable about uh, issues and some being much less knowledgeable about issues. Until recently, um, in ICANN, this wasn't so recognized. So it was a case of, well, you need to do capacity building. Just like what is said over here, everyone agrees capacity building needs to be done. Multi-stakeholder -stake systems need to uh, take place and, and to be implemented. 
Um, but there was absolutely no uh, allocation of resources to it. And that's extremely difficult. You cannot make a cake with no ingredients. Um, and in, in that case, we had uh, even less than no ingredients. And, and so uh, the regions, it was really up to the regions to perform capacity building locally using their own resources. And I don't think it was particularly fair for them to bear the full load of um, uh, being able to, to bring the region and, and bring their local stakeholders to the uh, level at which they could uh, uh, take meaningful part in, in, in the global conversations and the global discussions and decisions that were being made uh, when they were getting absolutely nothing re in return. Uh, and um, as you well know, uh, this is not just a matter of money, it's a matter of time. Um, you cannot teach someone a complete a book on internet governance in 24 hours. Um, and, and at the same time, uh, it's, uh, capacity building is not only just teaching people out of books, it's actually getting them involved. Um, I often make the analogy of you cannot teach someone how to swim out of a book or how to cycle out of a book. You might read the book, you will still drown, you will still fall off the cycle. It's point when cycling and when swimming and when actually being part of the uh, community and, and, and working in the process that takes place, uh, that you will learn a heck of a lot more than just reading about it. Uh, so capacity building comes up in, in these two different ways. It's about enabling the end users. It's about enabling people and being able to take part in those processes. And enabling people requires travel, requires face-to-face -face meetings, requires a lot more than just having an online course or having a book being sent by post um, uh, to people. It requires mentoring. It's a whole number of things that have to take place. And all of that is very costly. So the high-level principles of capacity building are very well understood and, and everyone loves to use those because it makes people shine and look good. Yes, I support capacity building. Yes, super. We need to enable everyone. Power to the people. Every, you know, the whole. But in practice, um, I have not seen organizations take that as seriously as they should have. Uh, and organizations, by, by that I don't just mean uh, civil society or, or organizations like ICANN. I mean um, companies that benefit from the current internet multi-stakeholder system. The vast majority of them out there don't even think about the fact that they need to help out the fact that internet governance runs in a multi-stakeholder way and you need to have stakeholders that know what they're talking about if they are not to be replaced by another system that might be multilateralism and that might therefore involve just a, a certain level of stakeholders, which in the majority of cases would be governments, um, and knowing the fact that the internet runs on innovative ideas and on the fact that it's really down to the edges to uh, make the, 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 build the future of the net, um, it, it really runs counterproductive to not actually enable people uh, and, and not have any capacity building uh, taking place. So that's my my feedback on this. Um, I'm, I see some change at the moment. It, it, you know, the, all is not lost. Uh, there are several initiatives that are starting, um, but uh, I just hope that it's not too little too late. Um, we really need to have a wake-up call on that, and uh, everyone needs to have the wake-up call. Maybe it can start here, and hopefully we can bring that message over to those that have deep pockets, um, because otherwise we're not going to get very far. We're just going to light a little fire. You know, when you, when you do capacity building in a region, and we've done local capacity building in our different region lat large organizations, um, it's interesting because you, out of, let's say, and I'm taking sort of open numbers in the moment, out of 30 people, uh, you might get only a subset, maybe six or five people that will actually pursue. If you, go, if you, if you do one, one, once a while capacity building, you might get six or seven people that will actually benefit greatly from it and that they'll get into it. You need to do it again and, and actually continue doing it as an ongoing measure, not just a one-off, uh, and accompany people in their trip um, so as to be able to have a higher yield of success and having more people uh, involved. I don't want to monopolize the thing, but that's, that's the, the sort of view that, that I have from uh, my part of the operational multi-stakeholder model, one that actually uh, has to uh, come up with statements and with, uh, with work that uh, then affects millions, uh, should I say billions, of, uh, of internet users worldwide. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Onegito Ekpe from Nigeria. 
actually, I, my own suggestion goes this way. At least national governors, government should be involved in e-careers because I have a challenge in Nigeria, they said, using as an example, we have top hierarchy officers do, that do not understand what is internet government or governance and do not have capacity to use the ICT platform. So they render the system unproductive and making governance more tough and expensive. Now, the first state in Nigeria to really have e-government is cross River State. Why? Because of the interface with development partners. They insist transparency, accountability. In fact, in the Executive Council, it's only um, a paperless procedure they use because everybody, your material is sent to you via your email, so you use your laptop or iPad to assess information and do transaction in, and the governor insists on that. Now again, like I personally, through APC, I got to know about Diplo Foundation. Diplo Foundation gave me scholarship to do two courses, and then the policy I paid, uh, they also gave me partial scholarship. With the zeal, I had to save and sponsor myself to this IGF. Now, if people get trained, how do we follow up how they extend the training to others? It should be very paramount. You could bring people to train, train the trainer, they go back, they do nothing. So there should be a system whereby after training somebody, you should also follow up how many have you trained. And when you do follow up, those persons that have been trained also have emails. So you contact them to get feedbacks from them. Like I did a training for some medical students in um, School of Health Tech. I had to forward the list of all those that were trained to World Health Organization. So at their private time, they got, just sent mails to them. Hey, how are you benefiting from this training you got on Hinari? And the school today is benefiting from World Health and SIDA without even my knowledge. But one of those days, they called me and said, hey, folk. You did us a great deal. Take a gift. Thank you. Hello. Yes, hi. I'm um, Nayel I'm Harper from the um, Internet Society. So, so I'm Senior Manager of Next Generation of Leaders, which is the um, Internet Society's program that's focused on developing um, young professionals between the uh, ages of 20 and 40. So in, in terms of capacity of building, we've recognized that that capacity building is definitely um, aligned to in, in, to enhancing outcomes in uh, uh, regions as well as internationally. So we've t taken a number of um, different uh, steps to, to ensure that we can achieve some of these outcomes as well. So I think for a number of uh, years now, we've been delivering our f fellowship program. So there's the fellowship to the um, IETF, the fellowship to the um, OECD, IGF ambassadors. And in 2013, we've moved to public policy guests to the IETF to, to kind of bridge that uh, lexicon where there are a lot of public policy um, individuals who don't, ha who don't have a good understanding of what and what it entails to be involved in open internet standards development. We've also been sending regulators to the, the, the IETF as well, just to bridge, to bridge those gaps as well. And another step that we've taken this year as well, um, we've developed our own uh, learning management system. So it's, it's called Inforum. And basically, the, the approach we've taken is that since 2009, we've been delivering our online learning program. And that's a six-month six certification course that takes, the, that takes the learners through a full length and breadth in terms of the internet governance subject. So it's rather the, the history of the internet, the technical standards, regulatory frameworks, SkyG for, for, for development. And... But by developing our own internet, our own learning management system, 
we've gone to, to a point where we, we want to move forward from just our moderated type of format, but also move to self-based so that we can scale and, and grow because we basically only reach about 150 persons a, a year, but we, we believe with self-based we can reach hundreds as well as t t thousands. So on top of the the learning management system, we're also working with a number of partners and subject matter experts, both internally to the ISOC as well as in other ISTAR organizations to, to develop an online library of assets that we can actually surface on the, the learning management system. And this is in addition to our, our e-learning course. We have assets on managing online identity. We have assets on cybersecurity, assets on spam that we're developing. We've also partnered with the um, with Virginia Tech to, to develop an open internet standards um, online course as well to get more university students as well as professors involved in the work of the IETF. And the um, overarching goal is to really develop a community of learning, now, not just us operating in our own silo, but also partnering with organizations like DTTPLO and ICANN and other organizations to have this, this format of peer-based learning that allows more voices in the, the dialogue and more competent processes as well. So that's basically it for me. Uh, uh, this is Vinayak from Data Security Council of India. I would like to uh, share my experiences. Uh, this is primarily a capacity building program that we run in the country for the police officers. So the kind of program that we have is uh, for the cybercrime investigation program, uh, uh, police officers or law enforcement officers may not have the capability to understand, comprehend the new type of the crimes. So this is uh, Data Security Council of India is a kind of industry initiative set up by IT BPO companies in India. So what we do is we get a funding from the industry. And we had set up a labs in around eight different police premises in India. And we train police officers, we deploy people there. <coughs> so till now, I think in the last five years, we have trained more than 30,000 police officers in different levels of the training program. So like uh, we have level one, level two, level three training programs where we train police officers uh, in crime investigation program. So what we try to do is create an infrastructure there with the funding from the industry, we deploy people to do the training, uh, add a structural way of delivering the training program, standardize the content for the training program. So we have now published uh, different levels of training books also, training material also for that purpose. And in a way, try to harmonize the training across the India. So that's what the experience and operating capability that we have in India. But if you look at the scale requirement for this kind of training, India has around 1.4, uh, 14 million police force, uh, which needs to be trained, at least some portion that needs to be trained. So this program, this operating capability that we earn uh, in our five or six years of the training to police officer, so this needs to be scaled up, scaled up to each states of India. There are around 35 states and union trade in India. And this scaling up require you to have that funding. So now we are approaching to the government with a what kind of operating experience that we have, what kind of funding mechanism that we are able to build up, in production that we have built up, and kind of operating experience and technical skill that we are able to generate out of that one. So now we are approaching to the government to scale up it to the national level. So each state of India should have some kind of training facility for the cyber crime investigation program. Each state of India should have the people who are training those police officers. So this is a big program, so funding is a challenge for this kind of big scalable program across the India. But that's what the experience uh, that we had gone through. So, But in, in, in doing so, so what we learn is basically uh, you need to create some kind of physical infrastructure to have that consistent training program there. You need to standardize the content. You need to have a very professional way of delivering the training program there. There should be consistency of skills that you should be able to deploy this kind of training program. And very importantly, uh, significant amount of executive efforts are required to run this program as a program approach. So these kind of experiences that we have in India, like uh, 
uh, able to establish that one, and we hope that in another one or two years we'll able to scale up uh, to a level where uh, each state of India would have this kind of training facility. And we have already submitted a proposal to the government of India, and a big chunk of amount government is thinking to dedicate for this program. So this kind of a private sector initiative in the country, which would now become a national level initiative in the country. Good morning for everybody. <coughs> My name is Nazare. I'm from Brazilian government, and I'm a member of the steering committee of the internet. Uh, we are trying to to build to to build a model, uh, multi stakeholder, to to get uh, all the the views, all the different perspectives, the private sector, the, soci the civil society, and so and the government and the universities uh, to, to find a way of uh, solve our challenges that are huge because uh, our country is very, has a great area with, uh, f with lacks of uh, infrastructure of telecom and the prices that are not good, for, for instance, and also all other inequalities that a country like ours have about literacy and about uh, uh, many things related to it. So we are trying to make this, uh, this space to, to listen and discuss and uh, propose uh, some ways to have funds, to have regulations, and uh, it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a process that uh, we learn with it every day. But I think that uh, all the other capacities in the country, uh, like the, the people, the organizations that uh, fight for digital inclusion and things like this, uh, they have a voice in this model and uh, we are all the time trying, not that we had already get, uh, to, to let our uh, congressmen uh, aware about the importance the, the, the issues we have, we are discussing. So I think it's our uh, main reflection about uh, capacity building, and uh, uh, I think uh, the things the the other colleagues uh, told here uh, are also uh, the India guy, the Nigeria guy uh, had uh, something to. We have to learn too. We are together our region, Latin America and uh, with another partners in the world and trying to learn more and uh, to improve our uh, democracy that is still young. Thank you. Do you think I should say something? <laughs> um, I think that um, from my perspective, like I... Oh. Um, Maureen Halyard from the Pacific. Um, one of the things that really got me on the road for to to doing the sorts of work that I'm doing at the moment um, was the initiation that I got into internet governance through Diplo. And um, I mean, I think that that really, I mean, if for anyone who is going to be doing anything in the area of development. Um, that training program that Diplo gives in internet governance is is the mainstay of it, and um, it really set me on a path of um, you know like where to from here. And um, 
that I went to my very first um, IGF in 2008 with, um, with Diplo and it was the most amazing experience. And from that, in 2008, I actually ran my first um, INET in, uh, in the Cook Islands and that also using that, that whole internet governance um, thing we actually built um, on our, through PICISOC. And then from there I got to be the um, board chair just a natural progression, I don't know. But um, one of the things, too, is, you know, like, as um, Olivier pointed out, it's, you know, like, I mean, when you're doing capacity building, funding goes with it. And I was extremely lucky when I did my internet governance um, program with Diplo, there was funding. It was, you know, there was funding available. Um, whenever we try to do anything um, gov capacity building wise across in, in, my, um, in my internet society where there are 22 countries in the region that we cover we try to provide training internet governance as well as technical tra um, training in our internet um, in our PAC INET which is really, really difficult. We try to hold it in a, different <clears throat> in a different country every year to try and sort of, like, get some spread. Um, the, funding for, um, the funding for this has to be... Um, we get a, um, funding from, from ISOC, of course, the um, event funding. But what we do is we say that the... We ask the um, government that is actually going to host um, the event to take on some responsibility. Otherwise, we don't, you know, like, I mean, there's no way we could, we could fund it every year to actually sort of, like, you know, be able to get a big venue, be able to transport people from all over the different countries to a particular, um, to a particular site. Um, so, I mean, I know the difficulties of capacity building, and so this is where we are now having, you know, like, I mean, I'm looking at the um, ICANN model and um, similarly with the ISOC, trying to look at online ways of, you know, providing, providing that model from within ours that perhaps um, mirrors a lot of the stuff that um, Diplo um, actually does because in order for them to understand development of the internet within, you know, developing countries, especially in the Pacific, they, there's a real lack of understanding and this is not just with the user group. We're talking the decision makers. So that, you know, like I'm, this is, you know, like I mean, I'm really pushing that ISOC and I can get into the decision making level. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, I mean, Vlada, you know, you had, had that experience of working even with the, um, the regulators um, at that stage. And it was really important getting to that level and hopefully regulators have you know input into that upper level but I mean in the Cook Islands we still don't have a regulator I mean that's you know so uh, Olivier Crepin-Leblon uh, again actually the lack of understanding from decision makers is not solely restricted to developing countries um, capacity building is seriously needed uh, with uh, decision makers in Europe and, and elsewhere. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> don't think it's just a developing country thing. It's it's everywhere and all across the board, uh, from uh, uh, presidency to parliament to uh, decision makers in Brussels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's uh, sometimes you just pull your hair out and think, where did these people come from? They uh, don't even know what the internet is. I wonder if they know how to use a mouse. Well, they probably do now, but uh, okay. I hope I'll be able to get back to Brussels at some point. Yeah, just a, a, a quick point about funding. Um, in terms of the, the resources for the, the um, I thought to deliver online learning as as well as some of our fellowship programs. It's not all self self funding. A lot of the funding comes from organizational partners or industry partners, um, the private sector, people who have a, a vested interest in maintaining an, an open and accessible and uh, user centric uh, internet. 
also from a resource perspective, we also draw on our partnerships in, in terms of other ISTAR organizations or academia. And we even also draw on our alumni because a number of our alumni from our e-learning programs have their subject matter experts in their own right. So we even leverage their expertise in terms of supporting on the ground type activities, whether it's in Africa, Asia Pacific, or South America. So there are a number of ways that, that we can pool our resources that's not necessarily limited to financial resources. Thank you. Uh, I might su summarize it, but before I, I wanted to check if anyone else who hasn't spoken yet, Dijani. Thank you. I'm sorry to be late because I was in another session and uh, I crossed someone in the corridor. He... Ah, excuse me. Yes. Um, my name is Tijani Benjama. I am from uh, Tunisia and I am from uh, Alak uh, Afralo. So, um, uh, speaking about capacity building, I think that uh, uh, the need of capacity building is for everyone at all levels. I remember in uh, WSIS, from the first phase of WSIS, I had a big disagreement with uh, all stakeholders of the North. They all think that uh, bridging the digital gap, uh, 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 the most important element for bridging this gap is the infrastructure. I tried to explain them that uh, the, uh, if you have money or if uh, those countries are giving money, uh, they can build the infrastructure in one year, in two years. But even if they have this, uh, uh, this infrastructure, if people don't, don't know how to use a computer, it will not be use, uh, useful. And uh, so to build the infrastructure, it will need some short time, but to build capacity, it will, uh, it will uh, need uh, uh, perhaps a generation. So we, we had better to go on capacity building before any other thing to bridge the digital divide. Thank you. Okay, um, my name is Andrew Mack. Um, I'm based in Washington and a member of the BC, but we work very extensively with uh, emerging markets countries, Global South, mostly Africa, Latin America, and a little bit of South Asia these days. And um, I'm also, uh, um, uh, frighteningly, a, a former uh, uh, World Bank employee. That's how I know a lot about Indonesia, having come here uh, many years ago with the bank. And frighteningly, because the term capacity building is, is probably every, every, mentioned every third word in, in a World Bank uh, report, right? And so it, it, for me, it has lost a lot of meaning. And so uh, what I usually do is I think about capacity for what? And if you look at it, let's talk about in Africa where we work a lot. You've got capacity on, on so many levels. You've got capacity of the users that Tijani mentions, which is incredibly important, especially as all of these new GTLDs are coming, right? all the new functionality, all the new opportunities for risk, for compromise of personal data, for spam, for phishing and farming, and the whole nine yards, right? You also have capacity amongst government officials because most government officials in most countries are not, are, are, are not chosen because of their technical cap capacities. They're, they're, they're chosen because they know the president or they're friends with somebody of, of importance, right? And that's not just in the global south, but they are, not, they are chosen because of their, their political connections. So they need capacity building. We have conversations frequently with people who really kind of only vaguely understand. And you've got capacity of the, the middle level who are oftentimes in, in government for two years and then they shoot off to Canada where they work for Oracle or whoever it is, right? And that's very typical experience. And, 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 and my, my experience is that it is, it is, it is something that has to be a part of our everyday. Almost by calling it capacity building, we, we cheapen it because we say this is something that, it's, it's, almost, it's, it's like exercise. If you, uh, you can't say I'm going to go and have an exercise project 
Exercise has to be a part of your life kind of on an ongoing basis, in part because you need it for your health and in part because your body changes over time and this environment is changing over time. So I, uh, I see it as a, an area for an awful lot of improvement and part of it is an improvement in the way that we think of it. Um, so, my two cents. Thank you. Angelic Fatima, you want to add something? Or? No. Not for the moment. It's just the same, like, what's all said. <laughs> yes, I'm Angelique Ali Hussain Del Castillo. I'm from Suriname. And um, I'm also a Diplo fellow. Diplo also, I benefited also from the course. And um, it, it also led to me uh, presenting my government a, a policy proposal on internet governance which up till now um, is in a drawer somewhere, I think. <laughs> because, because as was said here already, it, you know, it, it's just a, a lack of understanding and, and sometimes a fear to acknowledge that, that, that there's a lack of understanding in the, in the decision makers. Um, and then there's a lack of understanding in the users, which brings about fear for, for, for new things. If you, if you tell them you can do this this way or you can do research that way, um, they feel like, yeah, but people will probably know what I'm doing because they don't understand how to protect themselves, what is allowed, what's not allowed. So I, I think it, I have to agree with what was just said by, I, f I forgot your name, Andrew, um, that it's also in the way we think about it, it's a daily thing. It's not something you run a course six weeks and then you're done with it. You know, it's something that ha is working every day. And I, I could see it in, uh, in, in my office after I did my course at Diplo, I would kind of become like a, the person they run to when they have a question. And I, I shared kind of the course materials, but they, most, a lot of people are lazy to read through it, so they just come to you and explain to me how this works. And when you explain to them, then they go one step further. You know, they, they understand better. Um, so that's what my role became. I became kind of the expert while I'm not the expert. <laughs> to, but it's it's everyday thing. Every every day there would be somebody at my desk asking some kind of advice, how to deal with this or how to deal with that, and um, and so I think it's it's a daily thing, and it's something you as a person just have to re be involved with, but also make people aware of every day. Not just keep it for yourself, but share every every opportunity you get and every podium or stage you have available. Just share with people the the the. the possibilities, you know, the, the way to work with internet, um, the, the, the way you grew from it, you know, what it did for you. Um, and, and then I hope that our governments, as I see now we have e-government, um, but it's not interactive. It's just a page you read. You cannot write anything. It's just a page that comes up. And um, so we, we're in the early stages, I think. We have to keep pushing. We have to keep talking about it. Um, and, and we have to keep sharing. Just, just one last point from, from me. I am also a, a Diplo Foundation uh, alumni, and Diplo's course has been uh, integral of extreme importance in terms of preparing me for my work in internet governance and, and development. Before you say you're a Diplo fellow, I'm also a Diplo fellow. <laughs> 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 I'm Fatima Cambronero from Argentina. I am a MAC member here. And I am involved with ISOC, Next Generation Leader Program and Diplo Foundation courses. <laughs> uh, just uh, some points that related with uh, the comments the, uh, previously. And I like the, the point of Oliver regarding the, the um, capacity building uh, process as a bottom-up process from local uh, local level to global level. And uh, also I think the, the, the capacity building uh, should include theoretical knowledge and also practical information about how to participate in different uh, spaces like, uh, like the ICF and also like ICANN, for example, uh, because uh, some people uh, go to the ICANN meeting, for example, and didn't know how can involve in different uh, constituencies or in different uh, spaces related to uh, their interest. 
and uh, I think it's the, these are my points for now. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, maybe I wanted to add uh, just a short note about uh, from some of my thoughts and, and maybe a bit about Diplo because maybe few people don't know about it. Uh, very, very briefly, and also to remind. Sometimes I get the impression when we get around the IGFs and we are really a sect, uh, Diplo sect. But it, it's a funny thing, and I think we should be quite clear with that with the others, whoever of us, ISOC, uh, ICANN, uh, Diplo, whoever does the programs, Indians and so on, bring people to the IGFs or wherever, that uh, usually people say, well, these are Diplo people. I said, no, these are Diplo alumni. These are I ISOC fellows, ISOC alumni. They're not behaving or talking about ISOC or from ISOC perspective or Diplo perspective or whatever. Uh, these are just the alumni. They, they are on their own capacity at the IGF, and that's really important. The fact that we bring people to the IGF it doesn't mean that they represented us necessarily, right? Um, but what I wanted to say, okay, you know most of you about Diplo, but just in, in, in two short sentences that um, our focus is on policy and, and uh, well, diplomacy, governance, and, and technology. So these interplay. And uh, I definitely support what, what um, um, we mentioned at the beginning about the complexity of the process. So what we understand as a capacity building process is definitely not just a training, a single training, but it has to be whether it's online or in situ or the best is the blended com combination where people can meet and also interact online. But then bring them to the process uh, somewhere. That means they can have a meaningful participation and then keep communicating with them, keeping the community around, which is also important to have the community around. Uh, and uh, uh, um, and keep it in a way in a multi-stakeholder uh, process if you can keep multi-stakeholder composition of the of the participants. Now, one thing that we noted, and I think it's quite relevant when we uh, talk about targets, is that if we want, and that that's what you mentioned, Angelic, you you can do a lot of things on your own as capacity, and then you can achieve a lot. Or you can write great papers, but no one knows that you have this capacity. So there is what we see, what I see as a pyramid. On the top, we have decision makers. On the middle, we have uh, people that are, that are maybe, uh, in a way, practitioners when it comes to the policy makers and policy making. And at the bottom, we have people that are effectively implementing all of that. And unless all these layers know that they, are, they have educated people in the other layers, it doesn't help. Because if the top of the government doesn't know they have educated people in the bottom, to ask when there is a security problem and they don't know who to call, they know there is someone who, who they can call, it doesn't make sense. And also, I mean, if, if, if you know so much but the government doesn't know, and, and so on. So this kind of propagating throughout the structure in the country is really important. Now, these were my notes, but then I want to uh, try to summarize a couple of aspects that we covered. One is we started... Uh, and Olivier uh, mapped a couple of, and you added a couple of components that we that I catched, but uh, please add up of the capacity building, which is uh, any kind of kind of face-to-face -face or online training. A lot of mentoring, training the trainers, evaluation of the training, um, community building, fellowships, and bringing people to to the putting them in the process. So at least that. I don't know if I missed anything, but please add. Then we had a question of what are the, who are the targets? And I think basically all different institutions might cover different targets, target groups. We mentioned we definitely need um, capacity of the users or awareness or whatever you, you put in, of the law enforcement agencies, decision makers, community, um, local authorities, academia, uh, entrepreneurs, um, well, authorities, national or even even global, uh, probably intergovernmental inter organizations as well, international organizations, um, diplomats. I don't know if I missed anything. So I think we should also clearly outline different target groups that, that capacity building should be for, and that those are different type, types of programs. Even. Then different topics that we, uh, not topics, but in a way, a coverage or focus of capacity building that you mentioned, policy, practice, um, organizational aspects or involvement, like you want to know more about ICANN in order to be involved in it, 
Um, you want to know more about diplomacy in order to be involved in the political processes. Um, technical capacity building, which is, which is really building IXPs or whatever. Regulatory capacity building. Um, once I even had a comment from a guy when we kept talking about capacity building on a panel, and then he said, now after the panel, I figured out that you were talking about capacity building from the human perspective. For all the time, I was thinking about capacity building of the antennas, infrastructure, building the capacity of the network. So that's also something we have to distinguish, and probably this kind of capacity building is also important. And then lastly, we talked about funding. And what I could map here, where funding com can come from, is the governments, which is, I think all of these are quite scarce, uh, I-star organizations and the technical community in that sense, and private sector. So these are, these are probably, well, local communities to some extent, but I don't know to what extent the funding can come from, from local communities. Now, these were the things that I mapped, that we covered. And I wanted to suggest that we try to move to the second part, which is how do we sync um, our and all the other efforts within the IGF in the next, um, for, for the next period? One interesting initiative came from UNDESA um, and one of the previous open consultations. So it's it's pity that, that uh, Slava is not here now, but it doesn't matter. Uh, where he invited to make a kind of a compendium of what does exist out of the capacity building initiatives within the IGF or among ourselves. And he provided a simple kind of a sheet, a table. Well, all of us could fit in, okay, the name, the type of the program, and so on. It was too simple. We might maybe extend it. And maybe we try to map and try to share as, as much as we can through our contacts to get as much as possible who's doing what. Uh, based on these things, like what are your targets? What are the topics or the focus that you do? What are the topics that you cover? What are the methodologies that you use? What is the geographical coverage? And so on. And we try to prepare that so that, uh, and use the IGF website to try to have a single place where anyone can, even a database, where anyone can come and say, okay, I'm interested about a community training in India on, on, on policy issues related to cybersecurity. Pop. We get who does it? What are the options? What are the differences? And so, so on. That's one thing for the people to be able to search if they need. And the other benefit of that, and I think it's becoming very much relevant in, in context of what we spoke about, lack of funding and interest of big guys besides that small talk about capacity, or big talk about capacity building but no steps, is showing the results of what has been done thus far by all of us. And I think this can help us, firstly, mapping what we do, and secondly, if we can share somehow the results of our work, whether it is the names of the people, community, I don't know. Let's think about it, how we can show the impact and say, listen, folks, we've been doing that, but we can't continue if you don't devote to that, provide funding, provide support. Now, that's what I wanted to hear about maybe also from you. What do you think, how we can improve maybe these steps or any other, let's say for, for 2014, between the two IGFs, what do we do next? Okay, one idea is the compendium and the database. The other one is showing the impact of the IGF, of the capacity building. The third one is probably showing the lack of finances. Folks, there is no finances. It's very limited. I remember a couple of years ago when we kept bringing people to the IGF uh, after going through the process uh, education so so we had even 20 fellows around uh, the IGFs. There were a lot of funds available from the ITU, basically the Canadians, right? Uh, Commonwealth bursaries, where you still manage to get to get the, the fellows to some extent. There were a lot of different programs. And I don't see it. It's not about diploma anymore. I don't see that Commonwealth doesn't have bursaries anymore. There is fewer and fewer this kind of bringing people. And if there is, there is some bringing of the youth, which is great. But again, without pushing them through the program, understanding what it is about, and then jumping into the, into the, 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 the process. I, want, I just wanted to, to maybe invite you to comment on, on what to do next, right, based on these. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Olivier Crepin of Blanc speaking. Um, certainly the, the involvement of the youth is something that obviously is very welcome. 
uh, in uh, the IGF and in other uh, international fora, uh, a few comments I have heard from participants is that it often appears to be a flash in the pan. They, they're brought in, um, made there to look good and say what they have to say, and then you don't see them again. Uh, and, and it must be quite distressful for youth to be put into this kind of environment and uh, um, perhaps even enjoy it and think they want to do things, and then afterwards no follow-up. Um, um, after that. Um, I wonder whether you are collecting statistics on the amount of funding in, in capacity building across all of the organizations that make up this space, including ITU, etc. Whether you're, you're collecting any statistics, um, annual statistics, um, to see the volume of uh, financial uh, sponsorship that, that there is. Uh, and that could also include financial sponsorship from uh, private uh, sector uh, organizations and from governments. Um, you appear to be saying there is a decrease in such funding, and that's quite distressful. Um, the other suggestion uh, was to introduce metrics uh, as well uh, as to the follow-up participation of those people that have been funded in the past. Um, I see a lot of colleagues here who are all Diplo students to start with, or. Uh, internet um, uh, society next generation leaders, um, which is always great to see. So we, we see the ones who are succeeding, but um, I wonder how many uh, are there that have not succeeded in being, being able to pursue the work. Um, sometimes it's not actually due to any ability or, or lack of interest. It's, it's really primarily due to the fact that they're not able to find an organization that funds them to, to come uh, to places like here. Um, I think we, we kind of have to understand we're the privileged few with many, many people out there that um, have tried to uh, secure a sponsorship to um, come here. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, I'm told, well, why don't they pay their way? Well, they already uh, are not working uh, in their main job. They're already taking time off work. Why should they pay on top of that? It's pretty crazy. So th th there's definitely, if we could have some statistics on this and, and year-on uh, statistics from year to year, and I'm sure other organizations would be able to supply input into this, um, it would be good to see if we're rising or uh, if, the, if the whole amount is actually uh, decreasing, which would be distressful since we speak more and more about capacity building <laughs> but fund less and less of it. Maybe just, uh, Vladimir, again, maybe just a, a short comment uh, about the statistics, the, the excellent ideas. Uh, the statistics of the uh, annual um, budgets or, or available funds is definitely something we should do, and I think it shouldn't be quite a problem if we simply, for instance, Diplo, and I'm sure Isaac and the others, have it on the website, what is the, what is the uh, input uh, for, for the programs, like the mm, annual budget and w whatever. And from, for instance, from Diplo's side, you can easily see that it's decreasing for IG programs year by year. Um, I, this, what I commented was more from a personal Im impression talking with people, but we should do that. Another thing we can also do is even share the, the, the needs or the budgets or what are, what are, for instance, the budgets that we need for different types of programs we do. So we have comparing what is coming in and what we might need in future. And the second comment is when it comes to metrics, I think it's really, really good point. Um, how to make a metrics of a success of or follow up on the community of the trained people, that's a really tough thing to do. We've been doing a community following for a long time, but it's hard, especially because not everyone has to get involved at the IGF. They can get involved at in national level, regional level, in telcos, providing small bits and pieces within institutions. It's hard to, to make this track, almost as hard as, as, as uh, or maybe not, huh? A big group, yeah. Ideas are welcome. Vlada, we live in a connected world. That's Olivia speaking. We live in a connected world. We're all on these uh, social networking sites. I think most participants uh, keep in touch with each other uh, and uh, so are aware of those who are left back home at the moment, uh, although we've tried our, our, our best. So to some extent, it's, it's, it's possible to get that information. I mean, this is all about information. Let's try to get that also to compendum. Huh? Uh, Neil and then uh, Mary. Oh, I just wanted to follow on what um, Olivia was saying. Um, you know, when I think back about with the Diplo um, class that I was in, um, or classes that I was in, and the number of people that I still maintain contact with in the different um, arenas, 
whether it's through um, the, the alumni, but also through ISOC, through ICANN. Um, it's just amazing the num, you know, just just where those um, people have gone, uh, have gone to, um, still in the um, you know international organisations. But as you say, um, it would be you know, like I've always wondered what happened to a lot of the others who were actually also um, you know um, doing a lot of that work. Um, but you know, like as um, Olivia says, you know, like they may not be on a public. Um, so I think, you know, working at national and regional level and that. But it would be really good to see where where those students are. Okay. okay. Um, just uh, a few points about some of the the steps we've taken to, to continuously engage our fellows and alumni. Um, for uh, one, we keep a membership the database at ISOC. So basically... We've what we've developed is a way to, to tag those those the, those alumni, and so that we understand when we have regional regional meetings or fellowships, we identify those persons as participants, and we continuously engage them them through that process. Another um, way that we continuously engage our or alumni is through our mailing list, as well as we have a LinkedIn uh, group, which we're constantly exchanging ideas, um, discussing best practices. We're also presenting them with other opportunities from ISTAR organizations like Diplo and Capricot and other fellowship programs to, to continuously have them involved in the, co the, the community. So the, the, the next step, that we're attempting to move to right now is to develop an engagement environment, sort of like an ISOX version of Facebook. And an environment that keeps not just our alumni, but our chapters and our organizational members engaged, constantly engaged and involved in the work that ISOC does. Okay, no, no. Tijan is speaking again. Um, uh, I do agree with Olivier uh, about the um, uh, the statistics, stati statistics, and the uh, metrics. And I think that uh, we need statistics, stati statistic for statistics for the metrics. <laughs> yeah, metrics. I said metrics. No, no. It's statistics uh, that, that doesn't work, but <laughs> metrics work very well. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, I have another idea. I think that uh, as much as you do uh, uh, in capacity building, it is always not enough, always uh, rudimentary uh, 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 if we compare it to the need of capacity building. We said uh, in a few minutes that capacity building is needed at all levels for anyone, for any uh, country, for a developed, uh, undeveloped, etc. So as much as you do as Diplo Foundation, as any I-STAR or any uh, foundation, will not be enough. So I think that the best thing to do as a, a step forward uh, is to uh, push toward uh, capacity building, build in the programs of uh, development for any uh, country, any organization, any, any national, local, or uh, regional, or international organization. It is something that has to be done every time, for everything, not only for technology, not only, as you said, we need uh, capacity building for all the fields and for all people. So I think the best thing is to think about it as a standing thing, a standing element of any program. Thank you. Any other comments from anyone? Huh? Okay, so um, if I may try to wrap up the second part, is that we'll try to to follow up. I'll I'll, I'll give a push on that to try to do a follow up on this collecting and making a compendium or, or collection of who does what, 
so that we try to create a database. The second thing is that we uh, together try to map the existing and the needed finances uh, into for capacity building programs. And the third one, and basically to show if there is a gap and or, or is not and so on, what we need for. And the third one is to try to develop a matrix, not really develop a follow-up on a matrix, all of us to try to show the effectiveness and, and uh, the impact of the programs uh, on the IG process, and not only the global but also local levels and so on. Um, and the, the last thing that I probably wanted to check is, uh, is there anything else we can do before the two IGFs or at the next IGF? Is there any, uh, I was thinking whether we need to push for, um, for, I don't know, a plenary session or a specific event where we need to discuss something. The problem is that whenever we discuss capacity building like this, we have only people that are doing capacity building. We don't have any governments apart from couple of here, but interested again in capacity building. Uh, no sponsors, no private sector, no, there's no one else who should support capacity building, but all of us that are working on that. That's quite an issue. I'm not sure how to, how to manage to get them. We'll try with the report and some follow-up of this kind with impact to show why they should invest more and not just talk about capacity building. But if you have any ideas, that would be welcomed. So what we might do at the next uh, IGF or in between is, is welcomed, right, now or, or later. Um, so if you have any comments on that, anyone? Or we just keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it. Um, and also how we can strengthen the capacity building track of the IGF. Uh, this is one, one way, but I mean, at the IGF as well, we had this, this year we, have, we had the pre-event. Um, we might have more capacity building um, uh, workshops or events, not necessarily workshops. We managed this year, the orientation session had a couple of big failures, which is primarily the time and the location and the lack of distribution of the information about it, and also lack of bringing the fellows that we have, because th those will be the, the best beneficiaries of the or orientation sessions. So there are a couple of improvements we can do. There's another thing that a uh, number of workshops that are proposed uh, for the IGFs are uh, in fact, of a capacity building nature. So next year, at least we in MAG will try to uh, try to get more information about these kind of workshops and stimulate to mark them clearly. This is a capacity building thing, so that people know. Uh, so the ideas about the, the, the how to strengthen capacity building track at the IGF itself is also most welcome. If no other comments, I would then just invite you to maybe leave your business cards or something. I would be glad to follow up with, with all of you. I mean, I have most of the contacts, but not everyone has. So uh, to be in contact, follow up on that, and, and uh, um, let, let's, let's just try to follow up on this. Huh? I think one copy is okay, then I'll just uh, retype or whatever and, and, and put, put everyone in contact, okay? Well, thanks for coming.